And this afternoon, we have our regular Bronx History presentation. And Roger McCormick from the Bronx Historical Society is going to speak to us today about old-timey Bronx, as it were. And with that, I'll hand it over to Roger. Um, I will try to unmute people later. Uh, if they want uh, to ask any questions, you can also just put your comments into the chat. And with that, I'll hand it over to Roger. Oh, thank you, Matthew. So uh, my name is Roger McCormack. I'm the Director of Education here at the Bronx County Historical Society. Uh, thank you all for coming. Today's presentation is uh, largely on the Bronx at the turn of the century. You know, by century, I mean the uh, 20th century when it really became urban for the first time. And I'm going to take you through some major landmarks of the Bronx, but also some more um, prosaic images of the time, which kind of illustrate the founding of the modern Bronx and uh, how it really is a you know, great urban center to rival Manhattan and the other boroughs. Um, so this first photograph is a photograph of the Bronx River, which is the only uh, freshwater river in New York City. Um, it starts at Valhalla in Westchester County, which is a very interesting thing to, to begin at Valhalla. Um, it flows obviously down to the Bronx into the East River. And it's naturally the dividing line between the very rocky and hilly uh, West Bronx um, and the East Bronx along the Long Island Sound, which is much flatter, uh, much marshier, uh, better soil. And as a result, it stayed um, agricultural for much longer than the West Bronx. Um, and the river at the turn of the century is really polluted. There's a lot of factories, a lot of mills. There's a lot of heavy and medium industry that goes in in the uh, 19th century, which continues into the 20th. But thankfully there was, later in the 20th century, there's been a, a as in our own time, there's been a movement of uh, a real e ecological renaissance to focus on um, ameliorating the conditions of the river. And there's a number of really important groups that have done that, including the uh, Bronx River Alliance and Loving the Bronx, which is another group. So this is a photograph of the Valentine Varian House, which is one of the museums the Historical Society runs. I just want to talk about this because this is a great example of successful preservation, um, which a lot of houses, particularly in the 20th century, were destroyed, historic houses in the Bronx, um, due to urban, urban development, urbanization. Um, but this house dates to 1758. It's one of the oldest houses in the Bronx. The only one that's older is the uh, Van Cortland House in uh, Van Cortland Park, which was the oldest uh, manor, uh, the, the head of the estate of the Van Cortland family, who were one of the wealthiest in New York City in the 18th century. Um, and this house is a cl classic uh, Georgian-style farmhouse, which is a popular style in the colonial period. Uh, named for the Kings of England, perhaps ironically, uh, given the revolution. But I like this, talking about this in, the, in terms of the 20th century aspect. Um, it's, a, as I said, a great example of historic preservation. It was bought um, in the 1960s by an engineer called William Beller, and he was interested in preserving it, and he entered into negotiations with the city so in 1965, the house is moved um, across the street from its original location into where it's found now, which is in the Williams Bridge Reservoir Oval Park, um, just, across, you know, just across from its original location. And it actually, the park actually was a reservoir that was founded near the turn of the century in the 1880s. And by the 1920s, it kind of outlived its usefulness. So it became, it was turned into a park uh, Robert Moses wanted to have an amphitheater there that would fit 200,000 people, um, but thankfully cooler heads prevailed and the house was uh, preserved. And this is our archives where we have um, basically any component of Bronx history you can think of. We have a nondescript attached apartment building that was converted. Um, but this is very interesting in that apartments like these are built soon after the, or 
real movement of people takes off in the Bronx when they build infrastructure at the turn of the century. Um, but most of the buildings like this are built um, in the 1920s and the 1930s. And it's a real testament to the huge burgeoning population of the Bronx at that time. Um, I'll talk more about this as the lecture goes on, but you had uh, the Third Avenue L, which was extended northwards out of Manhattan at the end of the 19th century. And it allowed working class people to live in the Bronx and to commute to their jobs in Manhattan and also to other places in the Bronx uh, with relative ease. And at that time, it was mostly Italian, Irish, uh, Jewish um, Americans, with some very recent immigrants. Uh, Jews in particular worked in the needle and the fur trades. And there was this big focus, uh, particularly in the 20s, on kind of alternatives to capitalism, cooperative housing, um, ending the classic uh, tenant landlord relationship. And you see this in a lot in co op city, is an example of that. Uh, the coops off Allerton Avenue were an early, early example of that. And some of the first um, racially integrated cooperative housing in New York City at a time when uh, the color line in the North was. Uh, not as bad as the South, but still a lot of a lot of uh, areas were segregated. Uh, and this is our other museum, uh, the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage on the Grand Concourse in Kingsbridge Road. And this also is it, uh, it's Poe's last home. He lives there the last four years of his life. That's where his wife dies, tuberculosis, uh, where he writes some of his best stories, including the Casa Amontillado, poems like The Bells and Annabelle Lee. Um, but this house is also saved in the early 20th century from destruction. Uh, it was, it used to sit just very close to where it is now, just to the, the southeast, um, a few hundred feet away on Kingsbridge Road. And at the turn of the century, they were widening uh, Kingsbridge Road, and the cottage was going to be destroyed. And two very important uh, civic groups, uh, the New York Shakespeare Society, and the Bronx Society of the Arts and Sciences uh, mobilized to save it, and they moved it to its current location in Pope Park in 1913, just to the north. And Pope Park was created expressly for the purpose of having a place to put the, put the cottage. So you see that in a lot of uh, successful preservation efforts, that there were these, you know, parks were created largely to, you know, have open space to kind of prevent um, you know, the college from being doomed to destruction. Um, and I want to give you some examples of, kind of the industry that was in the Bronx in the early 20th century, the end of the 19th. Um, so this is the Webb Academy shipbuilders home in uh, the Bronx. It was in, located in Fordham Heights. Um, the founder was very interested in incorporating engineering and science into shipbuilding. Uh, he thought it had gotten kind of too far afield from and become too divorced from the hard sciences. Um, and so this was in Fordham, and it still exists today. It's in Glen Cove now on Long Island. Um, but this is just an example of kind of the kind of rich diversity of industry, um, of institutions in the Bronx at the turn of the 20th century. This is a the Presbyterian Church in West Farms, which was one of the uh, earliest villages in the Bronx, uh, one of the first, uh, and then became one of the first townships when the, before the Bronx was annexed to New York City, uh, which is done in stages. So the Bronx is one of the few places, I believe, in New York State that's been part of three counties. So it used to be part of Westchester, Westchester County. Westchester County, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Westchester County until um, 1874, um, when the West Bronx is annexed. I mean, West Bronx, west of the Bronx River, which is like the concourse area, Fordham, uh, Highbridge, Mott Haven, et cetera. Um, and the East Bronx followed in 1895. Um, and then the borough was created in 1898. But West Farms is very interesting. It's just below the Bronx Zoo. Um, and this church was very famous. It has a um, cemetery for strangers and enslaved Africans. Um, slavery in New York in the, is abolished in stages. So it's 1799, they decreed abolition, but the final slaves graduated, so the final slaves are freed in 1826. And in the 18th century, um, it was, as I said, still Westchester, 
it was divided into really you had really large plantation style estates and then you had smaller families so the house i showed you before the valentine house that was he was one of the smaller farmers but he was still fairly wealthy the biggest states were those like the van Cortlands and thousands of acres uh the morris the morris's estate uh, governor morris was the so-called penman of the constitution he wrote it in the form we have today and Lewis Morris was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And their estate um, was much larger than the neighborhood Morrisania, which bears its name today, but it was in the, the Southeast Bronx. And of course they had interests in New Jersey and were also very prominent there. So I don't know how many of you were uh, Bronx natives or have spent much time here, um, but all the business now of the, of the of Bronx County and the borough of the Bronx is done on uh, the county building right next to Yankee Stadium on the Grand Concourse and 161st Street. Um, but at the turn of the century, uh, Bronx County didn't exist. So Bronx County is the last county in New York State. It's formed in uh, 1914 because people were tired of uh, going downtown to have their business done. And, you know, it was... You, know, you have a huge population. The population in 1900 is about 200,000. By 1930, it's over 1.2 million. So this is really a testament to the extraordinary growth of that time. So before they had the Bronx County Building, they had the Bronx Borough Hall. And this is built in 1897, right before uh, the borough of the Bronx is created in 1898. And the uh, architect, this is in the Bo Bo Art style, was George Post. And he was very prominent uh, in Manhattan as well. He built the New York Times building. Um, uh, it's escaping the New York Times building. Not Grand Center. Anyway, it's escaping me, but he was a very prominent architect. And this goes in, as I said, in 1897. It was located on East Tremont Avenue and third and third avenue it was right next to third avenue well and it commanded really uh, panoramic views of the bronx of new york city and sadly despite efforts of the bronx historical society the building was raised uh, in the 1930s after they had uh it had kind of outlived its usefulness and they built the bronx county building on the grand concourse This is the Zabrowski Mansion or the Claremont Mansion. This sadly is another historic building that was also raised later in the 20th century. Um, this is this was there's a gazebo there today. It was located in uh, Claremont Park. It's named for which it, it, at one time was part of the Morris Estate. And this is from uh, the 19 early 1900s. This photograph, um, but at the time, you know, you had a lot of mansions like this in the Bronx. And Claremont Park is formed out of the original Bronx Park system. So in 1884, uh, and this was largely stemming from ideas of the city beautiful movement of having urban areas that, you know, weren't solely urban, but also had a lot of um, green space and so on. Uh, so John Malele, who was an Irish journalist and political reform, uh, petitioned the city to buy up a lot of parkland in the 1880s. In the 1884, the New Parks Act is passed and they start buying up land and the Bronx Park system is formed in 1888, 1889. Claremont Park was part of it uh, and it wasn't just parks. They had a series of parkways to connect each park. So the Mosh Loop connects uh, Van Cortlandt Park to Bronx Park and Bronx Park is the nucleus of the system. It's where the New York Town Garden and the Bronx Zoo are located. And if you're there, you can get on any of the parkways and get to any of the other parks with ease. So Pelham Parkway would take you from the zoo or the Botanical Garden uh, to Pelham Bay Park, which is the largest in New York City. And as a result today, the Bronx has the largest acreage of any, uh, largest acreage of parkland of any of the five boroughs. Um, to give you an example, Central Park is 500 something acres. Um, on the other hand, in the Bronx, Van Cortlandt Park, is just under 1,200 acres. Uh, Pelham Bay Park is just under 3,000. So these are really enormous, um, enormous parks in comparison to much more famous parks in uh, 
in, in Brooklyn and Manhattan. So this shows, uh, this is a factory in the South Bronx. Uh, you can see they're bringing in, I think this was a cigar factory with stalls. And this is in the 20th century. So you see it still had horses, you know, Daimler Benz invents the car in the end of the 19th century, but it takes a long time for it to trickle down into society. So a lot of the old parkways in the Bronx were designed for um, horse-drawn travelers. This is another photo of it, manufacturer of fine cigar, Jacob Stahl. And particularly uh, in the 19th century and the turn of the 20th century, there's a lot of German immigration uh, to the Bronx, coming for the same reasons people always come, economic opportunity and so on. Some are fleeing a uh, failed rev democratic revolution in Germany in the 1840s. And as a result, you have this very interesting set of uh, German beer breweries in the South Bronx in the 19th century. Um, the Bronx was ideal because this was pre-refrigeration. So they would cut out uh, caves into the cliff faces in the West Bronx and use the caves to store the beer and to keep it cool. And you also had uh, clean water coming down from the Catskills down through the Croton Aqueduct in Westchester. And so to brew beer, you need, um, you know, really, really good water. And so the founding of the Croton Aqueduct, which I'll talk more about later in the 1840s, really, it's kind of outside of our period, but it allowed the Bronx to really, in New York City, to really expand, to, um, to effect effectively accommodate uh, a large population. Because when you have a big population, you have a lot of, and you don't have clean water, you get a lot of uh, waterborne disease, cholera, and so on. So this is the Woodmanson Inn, uh, Westchester. It's in actually, it was in Pelham, Pelham Bay in the Bronx. And they had a very famous chef here. And this is the early 20th century. So you can see it's still very open, very bucolic. It hadn't been, it hadn't been uh, extensively urbanized yet. He had a, a very famous chef from uh, England, uh, John Dingle, who worked at the Ritz-Carlton in Manhattan. And uh, there's a the chef here. So this is really, I'm, and this is, I'm gonna show you several photographs of the same place over time. Um, but this is the remnants of a mill from the 19th century called Reed's Mill. This is the Hutchinson River here. And this is essentially completely a uh, desolate area. And it was decided at first, there was this large debate uh, led by a number of very important civic people. One of them called Logan Billingsley, who was a, Bronx real estate developer, one time bootlegger, and wanted to put a Bronx to put an airport in the Northeast Bronx. So this is way up in the Northeast, right along the Hutchinson River, as I said. So the airport never came to fruition. For a time, there was a amusement park in this, where this mill is called Freedom Land. And that also kind of the so-called Disneyland of the East, but you know, it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. The rides and the exhibits were a bit hackneyed. It was seen as kind of uh, not trashy, but a bit tacky. Um, and later, at the end of the 1960s, Co-op City is put where this mill is. Uh, and I'll show you some photos of it. Here it is. Like, this is a little, little grainier, but you get a sense of this was where the mill was. And it's long since been demolished. And this shows the Hutchinson River. And this is where, this is a photograph. Of, this is where the mill was now. So this is, that's then. And this is roughly what it looks like now. So Co-op City is the largest uh, cooperative housing development in the world. Um, and it's built between 1969 and 1972. It's, a, it's oftentimes uh, unfairly uh, listed as the reason for the decline of the West Bronx. Um, but really, you have a lot of capital flight after World War II. It's when they build the suburbs. Um, the ideal became the white picket fence, so people weren't as interested in staying in the old neighborhood. And for a litany of other reasons, the concourse area in the West Bronx um, declined, declining quality in that period. Uh, this is Wendover Avenue in the Bronx in the early 20th century. You get a sense you still see uh, a lot of horse-drawn carriages, but the buildings are mostly uh, as they would look today. 
Uh, this is a bridge over the Bronx River. This is by Westchester Square, which was one of the earliest uh, towns, villages in the Bronx. And you can see this is early 20th century, so still you know, a lot of areas in the Bronx were very rural. This is uh, 143rd Street, close to 3rd Avenue, uh, near the end of the 19th century. You can see the smaller houses, uh, a lot of horse-drawn travel. And this area would rapidly change um, with the extension of the 3rd Avenue L. Uh, so 3rd, Ave 3rd Avenue and 149th Street is called the hub today. It's a huge intersection of subways, of transportation routes, and it's often called the Times Square of the Bronx. And so this, you know, this area would be rapidly changed as a result of that. Uh, and the, this area is called Mott Haven, um, which gets its name from Jordan Mott, who was an industrialist and set up shop in the South Bronx in the 19th century. And he wanted to make it a haven for industry. And he, his firm invented the coal burning stove. Um, and it's just a real kind of emblem of that uh, period of Bronx industry, both the um, Lincoln Memorial and the Capitol Dome were forged in uh, South Bronx foundries. These are children playing outside of the Stahl Cigar Factory. So here's the High Bridge and the Croton Waterworks, which I was talking about before. Um, this is a little bit later in the 19th century. You can see there's development here. This would be the where the, ma the Major Deegan is today. And the bridge would take you from High Bridge, the neighborhood in the Bronx, to Washington Heights in Manhattan. And it's a classical Roman aqueduct design. Uh, the engineer, John Jervis, um, wanted to make it a low bridge because that was more efficient um, to bring the water across. And the water would have gone through pipes inside the bridge. And he was overruled um, because of the damage that would have had on the river traffic. and. Uh, Several people tried to blow up the high bridge and to keep the river traffic, make sure there was no no um, check on their ability to bring goods up and down the Harlem River. So this shows a co-op city. So this is the Boston Post Road. This is a remnant of one of the earliest colonial highways, which went from New York to um, uh, New England to Boston. I uh, see the Bronx River Parkway here. This goes in in 1926. Pelham Parkway is obviously older. That goes in in the 1880s. And here you see Co-op City. Uh, Gun Hill Road is so-called um, because it was during the revolution uh, when the British come into New York City, the Continental Congress realized that uh, the, their navy was so powerful, they were going to take over the city quickly. So they decree that some of the cannon be moved out of the battery and stored along here on what is now Gunhill Road, because this area of the Bronx is very close to uh, the approach to the King's Bridge, which was the only, really the only bridge that enabled you to cross between the mainland and New York City at that time. And it's the oldest, it was the oldest toll bridge in the United States. It was built in uh, 1693 uh, by the Phillips family, who were literally lords of the manor. They had a grant uh, directly from the king. And his estate went from Spite and Dival well, well up into Westchester. And it was, um, they were notorious as Tories during the revolution. So their estate was uh, chopped up and given to smaller farmers after the war. Co-op city again. Uh, this is the Patel Garden ice skating behind here is the, and this is founded at the same time as the Bronx Park system. Uh, they were given a 250 tract, 250 acre tract of land in Bronx Park. And the Bronx Zoo was also given a tract on the other side, right next to the Patel Garden. And they're both um, world-class institutions today. But this is the Enid Hopped Conservatory. And this was modeled after the Crystal Palace in London. The Patel Gardens there. This is another view of it, the so-called Glass Palace. So, family going out 
in the East Bronx, the turn of the century. The Lady Washington, celebration of the revolution. They had better hats then, certainly. Uh, this is the construction of the Lorelei Fountain, which is in Joyce Kilmore Park, right next to the Bronx County Building, right next to Yankee Stadium on the Grand Concourse. And this was dedicated to the German poet uh, Heinrich Hein, who was very famous 19th century poet. Um, he, he's the one that said men that burn books inevitably burn men. He was a German Jewish poet. Uh, his works were burned during, during the Nazi period. Um, so this was initially the statue was in the Lorelei or the uh, mermaids that lure the sailors to their, to their, to their uh, demise. Um, uh, from his work, and it was in, the statue was uh, initially commissioned for um, Dusseldorf in Germany, but it was rejected because of anti-Semitism. Um, the mermaids on the statue of bare breasts, so it was rejected from Central Park on uh, on those grounds, and then it ended up in the Bronx. So anti-Semitism, Puritanism, but the Bronx had no objection. Uh, and it's really a great statue today. You can you can see it in Joyce Kilmer Park, who was a, a famous uh, poet. Uh, this is the Font Hill uh, Castle. This was uh, built for um, Edwin Forrest, who was a famous actor, uh, and he was famous for the the Astor Place riot, which is one of the deadliest riots uh, um, between uh, theater goers in the early twentieth century. And this is on the the Hudson, obviously, you can see the Palisades behind. And today, this is part of the College of Mount St. Vincent. Uh, this is the M Morrisania Town Hall. As I said, the Morris family were one of the most prominent families in the colonial era and the Revolutionary War era. Uh, Governor Morris and his uh, half-brother, Louis Morris, are both buried in, the, in St. Anne's Church in the South Bronx. And uh, despite, you know, the family had large interests in, in slave owning, slave owning um, Governor Morris was a, a proponent of abolition and uh, the revolution itself tended to divide these families. So um, Governor Morris was for the revolution, but his mother was a Tory and so on and so forth. Um, and this is a classic Italian town hall. This is uh, Edgewater Park. Um, particularly in the East Bronx, well into the 20th century, you had a lot of bungalows. They would be like summer homes for people um, before it rapidly urbanized, you know, beautiful houses on the sound. Um, and when Robert Moses built Orchard Beach uh, in the East Bronx, which is in Pelham Bay Park, um, it was a, it's a man-made beach. He brought in water from, he brought in, pardon me, sand from the Rockaways and from Sandy Hook in New Jersey. And uh, there were, houses like this along it, beach houses, which were unfortunately he destroyed when he had the park built. And Edgewater Park is in uh, Throg's Neck, which is uh, in the Southeast Bronx, close to Queens. So this is uh, Jerome Avenue and 167th Street in 1901. Um, so you can see, you know, this area is really urban today. So we're close to Yankee Stadium here. And Yankee Stadium is on what used to be a creek called Cromwell's Creek. So you can see even well into the, you know, well into the, the end of the 19th, and early 20th, still a lot of areas are very uh, rural and completely wide open, which is hard to believe today. And this shows Spite and Dival Creek. And this is a sunset over Spite and Dival Creek, which some of it is filled in uh, during the 20th century. And um, when they when they wrap.